What's inside the Statue of Liberty? And more importantly, is it true that it was inspired by a colossal Italian statue? Ciao ragazzi, this video was written and filmed in Italian by our team of scientists, storytellers and video makers, manually translated into English, but, but, dubbed with artificial intelligence. Long live culture and let's go back to the video. The Statue of Liberty is the symbol of New York as well as being one of the most famous monuments in the world. It is located in the center of New York Bay, directly facing Manhattan, on the small Liberty Island, in a position that allows it to welcome anyone arriving in the city by sea. The idea of building a gigantic statue symbolizing the United States' ideal of freedom, however, did not come from an American, but from a Frenchman. What you should know is that the Statue of Liberty was born over 5,800 kilometers from New York. In 1865, the French politician Édouard Laboulaye, during a dinner at his home in Versailles, proposed the building of a grand monument to be bestowed as a gift to France's American brothers, to symbolically honor the fraternal alliance between the two nations born from revolutions. It was initially just a proposal, but it took the form of an actual statue in the mind of Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi, who was there and who was a sculptor by profession. So, while the politicians were busy raising funds to finance the project, Bartholdi began to study and gather information to understand how on earth he could possibly build a statue that was tens and tens of meters tall. The solution that came to him was to create a structure with a cladding made of hammered copper sheets. And this is where an Italian monument comes into play. Bartholdi actually went to Arona in Piedmont, where there was a very similar statue. Standing at a height of 35 meters, it was the tallest of its kind in the world at that point. We're obviously talking about the Colossus of St. Charles, also known as San Carlone. It's a work that was created between 1624 and 1698 by the sculptors Chiro Zanella and Bernardo Falconi, based on a design by Giovanni Battista Crespi. The statue of San Carlone remains standing thanks to an internal support structure made of stone, brick and iron. Meanwhile, the exterior is crafted from very thin and light copper sheets. These sheets were worked with a hammer directly on the support structure and joined together by means of nails and tie rods. The arm, built to show the saint in the act of making a blessing, consists of a robust metal structure designed to withstand the strong winds of the area. Bartholdi stayed in Arona for several days to study the statue in great detail. He decided to make an even taller one, twice its height, and one that would also have to withstand even stronger winds. To do this, he enlisted the help of Eugène Violet-le-Duc, a former architecture professor of his, who designed the internal structure for him. Unfortunately, Violet-le-Duc fell gravely ill and passed away shortly thereafter, without leaving behind his invaluable instructions on how the internal structure and the external cladding were meant to be attached. So, what was to be done? At this point in the story, our dear friend Gustave Eiffel made his appearance. We talked about him in our video about the Eiffel Tower. If you missed it, you can check it out right away. Eiffel immediately abandoned the idea of utilizing a brick structure and instead recommended using the same technique that would later be used for the tower, one involving a lattice structure. So let's see what's inside the Statue of Liberty. The skeleton of the Statue of Liberty is a lattice structure made up of columns and trusses, which are connected to the outer cladding of beaten copper panels with rivets. In fact, Eiffel decided not to utilize a rigid connection between the skeleton and the cladding, as this approach could have caused tension to form and subsequently surface cracking. The use of rivets allows the parts of the outer cladding a certain freedom of movement and reduces the tension generated by the thermal differences between the outside, which is exposed to the weather, and the inside. The outer cladding of the Statue of Liberty is made up of over 300 copper plates, each one shaped individually by sculptors, then attached to the internal structure. This significantly smarter new project allowed Bartholdi and Eiffel to construct the statue itself in France and then ship it piece by piece to the United States, which also proved to be very useful for fundraising purposes. 
In fact, as soon as the head and the famous hand holding the torch were completed, the two parts were immediately put on display, one in Paris and the other in Philadelphia, as a sort of sneak peek of the statue. On July 4, 1884, almost 10 years after the sculpting of the first copper plate, the work was completed and symbolically handed over to the Americans in a solemn ceremony in Paris. The statue remained in France until the following January, the beginning of 1885, when it was disassembled and placed in over 300 crates. Transportation to the United States was handled by the French Navy, an operation that was anything but simple since it required a number of transatlantic crossings to successfully transport the statue in its entirety. However, the American inauguration of the statue didn't take place until October 28, 1886. What was the reason for this delay? Guys, it was because there was no pedestal. The Americans were supposed to build it, but they couldn't find the necessary funds. What proved instrumental was the intervention of the newspaper publisher Joseph Pulitzer. Yes, the same one as the prize, the famous prize, who, through the pages of his paper, convinced New Yorkers to believe in the project by showing them images of a magnificent statue that illuminated the bay. But just how tall is the Statue of Liberty? Without its pedestal, it's 46 meters tall, whereas from the ground to the tip of its torch, it reaches a height of 93 meters. Ah, one last fun fact. Did you know that it was originally a completely different color? The greenish color that we see now is not in fact what it originally looked like. As it's made of copper, it was initially the typical reddish color. So what happened then? Well, copper, when it's exposed to the air for long periods of time, ends up oxidizing, forming a characteristic greenish patina, and that's what happened here. But is it like the rust on iron objects? No, not exactly. While rust doesn't really adhere, copper oxidation remains firmly attached to the metal, thus preventing the underlying metal from being attacked. Incredibly, over the last century, oxidization has only affected the first 0.13 millimeters of the Statue of Liberty's surface. Dear friends, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let us know in the comments and you can also suggest new ideas for more videos like this one. I'll see you for the next video right here on Geopop Everyday Science.